Now, Dr. Najm Siddiqui will continue with the guest speakers for today. Welcome, Dr. Najm. Speaker tonight is, uh, yeah, I would like to welcome all the participants and speakers for the second day of the Fort Winter Symposium. The first speaker tonight is Dr. Fahad Al-Zajjali. He is Associate Professor of Biochemistry and Assistant Dean for Research, Sultan Qaboos University. Dr. Fahad has expertise in molecular medicine, disease pathogenesis, and genetic analysis. His talk, uh, topic of the talk tonight is vaccine development. Where does Oman stand? Dr. Fahad, you have 20 minutes to complete your presentation. Please, Dr. Fahad. Thank you also for the National University, Prof. Mohammed Shafi, Dr. Ali Dimani, for the kind uh, invitation to be around here with everybody, inshallah, today. I'll try my best uh, to have something which is interesting and uh, knowledgeable for everybody. Uh, and uh, inshallah, we'll benefit all from this, from this talk. I hope my slides is uh, visible to everybody. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I was given this uh, talk topic to discuss about uh, vaccine development uh, and how Oman is ready, ready. How Oman, where Oman stands uh, out in, in in the area of how to develop a vaccine. So I will try to mention about the vaccine first. Why vaccination is important? Just few slides. And then I'll talk about the, the process itself, how we actually generate a vaccine and what are the things we should uh, consider when it comes to, to design uh, vaccines. Okay. So WHO puts a lot of efforts, uh, especially in the, in the coverage for vaccination uh, in every country, whether it's a poor country, developed country, a developing country, because immunization is important, not only for the country, it's a global, it has a lot of global benefits. And why is that? Because in WHO realized that two to three million lives can be saved uh, by the immunization program. If you see some statistical data here, in 1990, uh, uh, there were 93 deaths per 1,000 live births. But in now 2018 data, this number dropped down to 39. So the WHO invest a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, efforts actually in uh, investing immunization system in every country. And that's why Oman has this extended immunization program that actually in the primary health care that covers uh, a lot of diseases and that are actually important because they reduce the mortality. Number two, uh, also there is a lot of public awareness going on against, uh, I mean, for, toward the vaccination. And they actually any hesitancy, if there are any population misunderstanding, people who have like misconcept about vaccination, they try to come up and uh, actually and try to you know, tackle this kind of hesitancy from the from the moment they start. So a lot of uh, program has been uh, developed for that. Also, a lot of data collections. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, um, only developed country, even poor countries. And there are surveillance departments in every country. And in Oman, we have the Directorate for Disease Surveillance and Control. Their, that, their importance is actually to collect data about different infectious disease and try to report that annually to, to WHO. So there is always a WHO office in Oman uh, discussing about uh, immunization. This is, for example, about uh, you know, pertussis in UK in 19, uh, I mean, when the vaccine has been developed, it's actually the, the, the number of cases being notified actually went down. But because the government stopped uh, you know, their efforts, I mean, the, the coverage of immunization around 1970, the number of cases went up. But again, the actually the, the program has restarted to increase the coverage for vaccination and the cases went down. So this is important because uh, recently there was an outbreak of measles because people were not vaccinated. Uh, there are a lot of uh, community anti-vaccination uh, communities. They're actually trying to mislead a misconception about vaccination. So some people start not to be vaccinated and that's why measles start to appear in the few years back. So in Oman, we have rules, the government puts rules and regulations about vaccination. And this is, as I said, is very important and many, many countries puts a lot of efforts toward the vaccination. Now, what is a vaccine? So that's kind of a few important introduction about why vaccination is important. But uh, what is a vaccine? Vaccine basically is a biological product. 
and we call it an antigen. Uh, this product could be a protein, could be a polysaccharide, it just has different forms. But this uh, biological product, which we call the antigen, it can induce an immune response. And when I say immune response, we are talking about different immune cells, we're talking about some naive cells which are not being exposed to any antigen. And uh, those cells actually start to induce uh, uh, some immune re re reaction that will provide protection for next exposure. And that's why we have a terminology called memory and boosters, using memories and boosters that I'm gonna talk about when I'm talking about my slide. So what's happened here, that uh, antigen is being injected and there are different forms of antigen. Usually we add extra uh, molecules to it, we call the adjuvants. And these adjuvants are important to induce the immune reaction in the, in the body. And then you're gonna get the primary cells like the uh, antigen presenting cells like macrophages and dendritic cells. They actually take up this antigen because it's a foreign antibody, uh, sorry, foreign antigen, proteins or a molecule. And then it will start to present it toward a different type of cells, like through different type of uh, major histocompatibility, or type one or type two. And then it goes to the T cells. So you need T cells that are required uh, that they can actually recognize this, which are on the already presented by energy presenting cells. And then you're gonna get two type of immunity. There is what is called the cellular immune uh, response, cellular immunity, which is cytotoxic T cells or there is that uh, T helper cells that actually will present this antigen to B cells, and this will produce antibodies. And this is what we call the human response, where is you need antibodies that are produced by the body to tackle this infection. So that's why the whole system is requires, uh, I mean, a good system, a good immune system. So you need a lot of naive cells, naive T cells. So that's why there is an issue of sometime you hear about the vaccine about the age, it says at what age this vaccine is efficient. So you can hear that about influenza uh, virus or vaccine. It cannot be as beneficial to an old person above 75 compared to the to the young person. Uh, and this is all because you need the, the, the thymus to produce uh, a naive T cells, which are important for the, you know, getting a new vaccine, a new antigen, they can produce a human response and cellular immune response. Also, the other factor also is also very important is actually the that there are some antigens that don't need the T cells. So we call the thymus independent antigens, especially the polysaccharide and the polymeric antigen. They actually just need the B cell and they induce the immunity without the help of the T cells. And also because of this, uh, uh, the whole system involves so many T cells, so many receptors, there's a lot of genetic variability. So, yeah, you don't expect the same result in every individual if I want to give the vaccine. So that's why you need large uh, clinical trials to know whether this vaccine is effective or not effective. Sometimes you see sub subpopulation where the vaccine is not effective to them because of some genetic variability in the, in the individual. And number two, uh, remember that some companies, when they produce this antigen, they, they add to it extra additive. And this additive to stabilize the protein or the RNA uh, sometimes they are stabilizers, sometimes they emulsifiers. They, they, some of them are egg products or yeast products. And this can induce a lot of uh, allergic reaction, anaphylaxis. And these are sometimes, that's why many, many companies which produce vaccine, they do the trial and they look for the side effects. And these are serious side effects. So therefore, many companies have different way to produce the vaccine and different additive they add to the vaccine. And as I said, the antigen is actually a molecule that induce the immune reaction, but there are different forms of these antigens that I maybe I summarize here. You can see that uh, uh, these different forms of antigen, it could be the same organism, but it is weakened or inactivated. We do see in the, for example, in the Corona vaccines, uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, we do see some company using uh, uh, live attenuated vaccine. And this vaccine actually is a, is a disadvantage that you need a lot of this culture. So you need a very special lab uh, that with the specific biosafety depending on the pathogen, and you need a large quantity, so you need to inactivate them. And there is a risk that they can also cause an infection and disease in the individual, especially immunocompromised uh, uh, patients. Or it could be the same uh, antigen, but uh, the same pathogen, but it is killed. So, and this, so there is a disadvantage that it will lose its antigenicity. Uh, Sometimes it could be a toxoid. Sometimes it is just basically a part of the protein. Like, for example, in the corona, we're using like the spike protein. So the spike protein, which is just a, the whole protein or just a domain of that protein. 
Uh, and that's why sometimes whenever you hear like, you know, in the vaccine, a new variant that appeared in the spike protein, you hear in the news, is the vaccine gonna be effective against this variant? So what the company, because the company will not reveal what sequence they use for their antigen. So the company will come back and say, no, actually our vaccine will be effective because this variant is not covered in the domain that we used to when we want to generate the, the, the vaccine. Or it could be a virus like particles, and these are actually uh, synthesized particles that you can actually make them. And uh, we uh, we actually can make this, it's very easy. So we, in the lab, we we use this kind of particles. So uh, for our like a different type of uh, other uh, uh, experiment that we do for disease pathogenesis uh, studies. Okay, and then there are like polysaccharides, as I mentioned, and there are these viral vectors. So these are viral vectors actually we use them for transfection. So what are these basic? These are basically contains the major structural part of the virus, but it does not have the replication capacity. So it's basically a virus that we add the, the, the gene of the interest. For example, this is the spike gene. This is the Johnson Johnson vaccine actually is made like this. So basically you add the, the gene of interest of the virus. And the, the good thing about this, that you can add multiple genes here, not only one gene of the virus, but this virus will, will not have the replication uh, capacity because there are some component of the virus which are required for replication. Uh, and this is actually a very good one. It has a, a lot of antigenicity and also is stable. So that's why there is a lot of talk about which vaccine requires like a cold temperature, require minus 80, minus 20, or is it at room temperature? So, so many companies, they can prepare this using uh, this type of vaccine. And there are the other vaccines which are new. Actually, they were under experimental trials before the corona, but now they actually they, they made it faster. And there is a lot of advantage with this that I'm gonna mention uh, later on. Uh, and this is here, you can either use the DNA or you can use the RNA. So you can use the RNA of that specific gene. It's the messenger RNA. So if this is the RNA, produce the spike protein in the cell. Or you use the double DNA, which is a plasmid. Uh, and here, like it contains the gene that produced the, uh, the gene for the spike gene. So this is like two advantages that uh, we talk about them in the coming slide. But there are other, which are like the vector, the bacterial vectors and the antigen presenting cells, but they are still under experimental trial, but they might come to the future. Now, something to also to highlight here is that, you know, sometimes you produce the antigen, which is the whole protein, for example, here. Only a small part of the, of the, of that protein will be actually used to present to the T cells. And that's why the antibody produce what is called the paratope that only identify this sequence of the protein. So what does it mean? So whenever you use the vaccine, you're not gonna produce one type of antibody. You might produce another antibody that identify this part of this. So there are what we call it polyclonal antibodies. So another antibody identify this part, another antibody identify this part. So that's why many companies, when they actually produce a vaccine, they try not to target a specific sequence. They might, for example, give you different strains. Like if you're talking about, for example, the spike protein, if there are some mutation here, different uh, mutation, different sequence of the spike protein, the company, when they prepare the vaccine, they, they also include this, they will include this, they will include this. So you'll include a mixture of different, what you call like variants of that protein. So idea is to that, you, you protect from different variants, not only of single variant, and also sometimes different strains. Like if you're talking about different influenza strain, we're not gonna uh, target one influenza strain, you might target different influenza strain, but, and this is actually an advantage if you use uh, like an RNA vaccine, because you can control the sequence with the RNA vaccine and the DNA vaccine. So the other question is that, okay, we have the company, they produce for us the, the vaccine. Now, how are we gonna test the effectiveness of that vaccine? Because remember my talk today is about how Oman is ready. Uh, so that's why I better said, okay, I will mention the type of the vaccine. I will mention how we're gonna test the effectiveness of the vaccine, and then we see where Oman stands out in when it comes to development of vaccine. So number one, actually it is done. Uh, if you design, so many companies, they actually produce, for example, let's say that I'm talking about this viral uh, vector vaccines. The company will design different types of vaccine, depending on the sequence of the gene, the, which type of stabilizer, which type of additive they add to the cells, and then they wanna test the, effic the efficacy of that vaccine. So they're gonna have different version, like version number one, number three, number four, and so on. 
and then they're gonna do it using an experiment on animals. And here uh, there are animals, like you know, there are some we know there are some viruses that does not affect uh, all kind of species. So like there are only viruses that only affect, for example, mice, but does not affect the human. So we use what is called humanized mice or humanized animals. So these are actually animals which are genetically modified. For example, with the coronavirus, there are genetic modified that actually they have the ACE2 in, uh, receptor, the antigenic converting enzyme 2 receptor of the human type. So we actually insert the human genes in the mice, so we call them humanized animals. So basically those animals can be infected with the SARS-CoV-2. So those animals are actually heavily used in the testing the vaccine. So you basically inject the vaccine and then you monitor the mice and you see whether they produce an antibodies or they don't produce an antibody. So it's as simple as it is. That it is done at early stage in the preclinical uh, trials. And there is also what is called the neutralization assay where basically you inject to the mice, or sorry, you can talk about mice, you can talk about monkeys here, uh, especially if you don't have a humanized model, you can use monkeys, uh, rhizos monkeys, and uh, they actually use in, uh, in big labs or big animals. Some people also use pigs, some people use uh, animals, some use in like, uh, it depends on which uh, laboratory facilities you have. So you can see different companies have different kinds of animal facilities. So I'm gonna talk about neutralization assay later on because this is also very important that we mentioned that. Now, but however, the most effectiveness of the vaccine is actually not this. This is just to see whether the vaccine can produce a protein and this protein can be recognized by immune system. But the most important outcome that actually many uh, in the clinical trials, whenever you go beyond the animal, beyond the lab, you want to go to the human and you want to test in large set of samples is actually to prevent the infection. And here, what you target, what is called the herd immunity uh, or the community immunity, like herd immunity community, because at the beginning, many people did not like the word herd because it's like some people came in the media and they said, okay, you're, you're, you, we think human are animals. So they change it to community immunity. But again, it's, it's still widely used, the herd immunity. So basically what herd immunity is, uh, is, uh, is uh, refers to is actually what the government of Oman is trying its best to actually to achieve. is basically when you have a population like this, Okay, and the blue is the susceptible, and the 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 one which are like you know the 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 beige color are the immunized uh, person, and this is a diseased person. So you have if you have one diseased individual at time point zero, so if he if he goes to the susceptible person, he can become diseased, but he can be like uh, uh, you know can become susceptible, or can he can he can also die. But if he goes to immunized person, he will not have the disease. So that's why what's happened is that uh, uh, if you have, uh, if you cover, uh, if you don't cover enough individual or not immunized, the disease will happen to the community and it spread very fast. But if you have an immunization level that is above a threshold, you know, there is a percentage, how many percentage of your population is actually immunized. If you achieve that threshold, what's happened, this vaccination program is gonna be helpful and it will stop the transmission of the disease after a certain time or, uh, point. And what is this threshold? Actually, it, dip, it differ from one disease to another disease. Uh, if there are diseases which are highly transmittable, they transmit very fast, you need very high coverage. But if you have a disease where it is like, not transmitted very fast, then you can have like a, a low coverage around 30% of the population. For coronavirus, actually, we don't have enough data uh, because you know it's uh, the RO is actually, we realize with the SARS cov it keep changing. Uh, the, how much is the, you know, the transmission of the pathogen. We have like a, a value that we actually measure from the infected individual, how many people, secondary people he infects. So you can calculate this, uh, the number. But in general, in influenza, they realize if you have around 80% and above, that is uh, enough, uh, actually optimal. We call it optimal. It's like you have to have target 80%. So now I think the government of Oman is trying its best to get the vaccine from the manufacturer. Uh, because this vaccine is requested everywhere by different countries, but also to cover the population. And they have different strategies that they actually try to, to vaccinate the high risk people first before we go into the second, uh, uh, like the low risk uh, individuals. Now, the other outcome is actually, they say, okay, reduction of disease severity. So maybe you cannot prevent the infection, like in SARS CoV 2, if you have immunized, you might get the infection. It does not like it does not. Uh, you know, it's gonna prevent the infection. But the most important outcome is that even if you get the infection, you're gonna get less severe form. 
So that's why when you see any clinical studies, when they come, people talk about effectiveness. They see, okay, they see, okay, we see the Oxford is around, okay, it's around 95. And then we're gonna get, for example, the Pfizer one is like 99%. Now, this is actually, you have to look about how effectiveness is measured. Is it measured because to prevent infection or to prevent disease activity? All the developed vaccines, they actually have 100%, almost the data which I look, they have 100% in preventing the disease severity. So, and this is what actually matters to us. We don't want to have a disease that is, can kill individuals. So that's why uh, we don't want to see severe ICU admission. So maybe one of the outcome in your study would be what is the number of ICU admission rather than number of infected people? Uh, and so people can use the rate of hospitalization. So this is kind of a studies uh, you can do when you want to develop a vaccine. So before I talk about Oman, let me just talk about this uh, RNA vaccine and DNA vaccine and why actually, because I want to mention it because the current uh, coronavirus actually based on RNA and DNA vaccine. So what is a plasmid? You basically get a plasmid DNA, which is a circular DNA. Uh, actually, in here in SKU, we use this kind of uh, plasma DNA. We actually do our own cloning. We have our own vectors, but we do it to study different disease pathogenesis. Like uh, we express some carcinogenic receptors, like oncogenic receptors. And this is the work we're actually doing with our master and PhD student here in SKU. And you can mix it with some lipid particles. We call them liposomes. We actually have different companies that can produce this. You don't have to manufacture them. You can actually buy them ready. Uh, and this will take the DNA and it will go to the nucleus. And this DNA can produce the messenger RNA and then accordingly the protein. And this, this protein will be presented to the immune cells. So this is the antigen at the end of the day. The problem with the plasmid DNA is actually, there is a risk that it can integrate to your genome. And this is actually what we see in our experiment. Whenever we trans, uh, like with transient transfection, we do see the DNA can be integrated to the genome. So that's why there is a lot of technology actually try to minimize this the genomic integration. That the, so this will be carried in your cells for forever. Like you know, this uh, gene will be there always and producing the, the the peptide, which is supposed not to be in your body. Now the other one is actually safer than the DNA, which it does not go to the nucleus. Is actually instead of giving the DNA plasmid, you add this ready-made RNA. So you put it inside the liposome. You mix it and then you give it to the cell and it will be carried out uh, inside the cell and it will produce the protein. Now, so this is safer than the DNA in terms of uh, integration, but the problem with the messenger RNA is the, is the efficacy, that is antigenicity. How can this induce immune system? Actually, it's much less compared to the plasma DNA. So both of them induce humoral and cell-mediated immunity, which are good. And here, what is the other advantage that you don't need to work with the pathogenic uh, strains. So when it comes to companies which are producing this vaccine, it's much safer than using lab attenuated vaccine. Like, you know, the Chinese vaccine, basically, they get the corona uh, virus and they grow it in a cell culture and they get large amounts. So that's why there is a risk of contamination. A risk of this pathogenic uh, variant can infect the workers in the lab or the workers in the company. So that's why uh, this one is produced safe and not only safe and faster. Because you know how much it takes for me to make an RNA it takes me one day in the in the synthetic uh, protocol. Now, if I want to, for example, now currently I'm working with the, some atherosclerotic project with the uh, I, what we do, we use some of the RNA to actually induce certain proteins. So what I do, I just uh, design this RNA and I get it within a week. So they are very fast and you can manufacture them. Uh, in a in a faster way, so that's why in 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 cases of emerging infection, like what's happened with the COVID nineteen, uh, if you want a fast way to produce a uh, vaccine, this is your option. So if you wonder around why why many companies they went for RNA and plasmid uh, DNA vaccine, but they did not go for lab attenuated, uh, this was the reason because they are faster than uh, you can see now. The Chinese uh, vaccine is still under trial. Uh, the data were not there released because it will take time to grow this vaccine and to make it for large number of people. But if you want to make mRNA and plasma because they are synthetic, you can synthesize large quantity in the lab that can be used uh, for faster uh, manufacturing. So that's why this uh, RNA vaccine were actually made. Now, when it comes to the RNA, we, there's an issue about the stability if I want to use RNA vaccine. 
uh, and also I said efficacy, uh, efficiency, we, I talk about antigenicity. The antigenicity is much less compared to a DNA vaccine. Now for the RNA compared to DNA, RNA is not a stable molecule. We in the lab, whenever I work with RNA, I have to work with minus 80. And even sometimes minus 80 is not even enough because this RNA is susceptible to enzyme degradation. There is a lot of RNA's uh, enzyme on the air. It's actually shedded from your skin, shedded from your breathing. So this is kind of protective from for the human. The, the skin can shed the RNA's enzyme in the air. And this is actually can, uh, it could be on your table, it could be on your, on your pen, on your desk, on your hand. So a lot of enzyme that breaks the RNA, that is actually a protective mechanism. So what people they do actually, they, to enhance the stability, there are ways in the lab. We can, in the bioinformatics, we can actually control that. So one of the way is to avoid double strand RNA because uh, the, if you have a double strand RNA, it will break faster. If it goes to the cell, the cell will easily identify it. And there is what is called the risk pathway. The risk pathway can actually, uh, the risk pathway can actually destroy this double strand RNA. Uh, COSAC sequences, uh, the five cap, there are different five cap on the RNA. We can synthetically design the one which are make it more stable and the, the poly A tail. So these are different like a molecular engineering. So we are talking about engineering here now. So you can engineer your RNA in a better way so it become more stable. So that's why you see some companies, they come, okay, our RNA can be stored at minus 20, no need for minus 80 freezer. Why is that? Because of the design of the RNA they made. And the other thing is that basically the uh, RNA is a, is a molecule, actually, if you have a cell, if you have an RNA, this RNA molecule can be identified by Tolak receptor. If you, people, students who are reading about immunology, there are what is called the Tolak receptor four for uh, lab for bacteria, but Tolak receptor number seven and 10, they can identify the RNA. And this can induce immune reaction in your body, in innate immunity. So, and this is actually, we don't want to induce because this can cause uh, side effects in the patient. So many companies, they use different modification uh, using different residues actually to avoid the innate immunity and to avoid release of interferon, uh, interferon one. Uh, so interferon one is actually induced if we inject any RNA to any individual. Uh, and also there are different um, tree halos, protamine, exosome. Actually exosome is another new field. And I believe in the future, the scientists we're going to use exosome for RNA because exosome actually are stable at uh, four degree and they can carry a lot of RNA and you don't you can make them cheap because you can use plant exosome and I remember there is one group now actually in US they're working on this exosome basically they get the exosome for any plants so they are using ginger they're using ginger meanwhile because they the guy who's working with this is a Chinese professor. He likes ginger. He said, we asked him, why you use ginger? He said, because I'm a Chinese and I like uh, ginger. So, but you can use any plants. And these are like exosomes. They are like small particles that nanoparticles that our body produce, but their function is to carry RNA and DNA and even proteins. So, so you can actually load them with the RNA that you want. And they are actually more stable compared to the synthetic nanoparticles. And this exosome actually can be injected and they are safe. They can go around the body to the lymph node, to the spleen, and they can induce immune reaction. And that's something which is, uh, uh, in the future, you're gonna hear about them, the, the exosomes. So when you see about the about our current uh, uh, vaccine, which are used in the, in the corona, uh, you can see here, for example, this is the Moderna. This is a messenger RNA 1,273, and this is, why I'm trying to tell you at the beginning is that the company, when they produce a messenger RNA, they produce different version, like one, two, three, four. So they are testing even 1,000 RNA. And they came up with this because this was the best that produced the best antibody levels. So that's why they came with this and they went to the clinical trials. And also the other one is actually, there's a Pfizer one also produced. It's the same idea. So it's in basically a messenger RNA. You particle it with the lacrosomes. And this we can actually do it in Oman. It's very simple, we can do it in any day. And there are many universities, they come up in the news, they said, okay, we design a vaccine. We can design the vaccine very easily in our lab. We have the data, we have the technology, and we are actually doing it in our lab. But the problem with us is actually going to the clinical trial, is going and tested in the animals. So this is something that we, we actually lack. So this from here, we can do it. Also, the, you can actually make an adenovirus. 
this is actually an adenovirus, which as I said, you can actually put the messenger RNA in a viral particle. So this is an adenovirus. You can use an adenovirus most commonly. You can always see adenovirus 26. Uh, and here is actually, this is like the Johnson Johnson uh, vaccine that came up now. So these are more stable and uh, they have higher efficiency. And this vaccine actually is, is virus. It can go to your body, but it does not replicate. So that's the important thing. It does not have, this is a synthetic virus. It does not replicate. So it can go and it can have higher immunogen immunogenicity to compare to the uh, mRNA vaccine. But you can also see other kind of companies, they also produce uh, inactivated pathogens. As I mentioned, there are some companies, especially from the, there is the Indian uh, biotechnology group. They actually produce this uh, inactivated. It takes more time. As I said, you need a spe specialized lab. You have to grow the virus in the large quantity. You need to make a, a protocol of inactivation. Uh, all of this can is actually uh, is actually involved when you de develop an inactivated vaccine. But there are other vaccines. Actually, we we did not hear from them, but there are actually in the clinical trials like protein subunit or virus like particles. They are actually will be coming. Like this is actually glass for Smith kind. So a lot of vaccines we underdeveloped, but uh, hopefully soon they will come with the clinical trial. So let's talk about Oman and where we are right now. So the first step for the vaccine development I talked about is actually the it's a biological product. So to design this antigen, and here you need a lot of bioinformaticians, you need molecular biologists, you need a lot of biochemistry, especially those who are specialized in RNA and protein. As I said, that we need to design engineering RNA that is actually has more stable, the five cap, which kind of residue I need to put, and what sequence of RNA, you need a lot of RNA, and you also need an immunologist. In Oman, we do this, and we have this facility. We can do it without any problem. I'm not talking about SPU, I think I'm also talking about other universities in Oman. We do a lot of research on plasmid DNA, and we're doing it on like a very commonly actually we have a lot of uh, plasma DNA we prepare for for uh, for receptor studies. So basically, I use it for receptor studies. We also use RNA. So currently, I'm working with micro RNA and uh, smooth muscle in the blood vessel. And especially people who have atherosclerosis, they get a hypertrophy of the uh, smooth muscle. So we try to control the the smooth muscle becoming hypertrophic to make it more metabolic. So there are some micro RNA we use for that. And actually, we use liposome. We use different type of liposome. We have like three, four types. We also use exosomes. So currently, I'm working with the kidney project where basically we use a lot of exosomes and we actually load the exosome. But we're using human exosome, not the plant one. We also have another way. Actually, if you have protein, you can transfer protein. We use what is called the chariot system. So this is a lot of biochemistry. So in this part, Oman can do it. Actually, we have all the facility, we have all the equipment, we have all the knowledge here in Oman. We can actually prepare this. And uh, so it's not something that uh, a new, that many scientists, you heard in the news, a lot of university came up with, okay, they just want to come in the news. Okay, we design, we can make a vaccine. Okay, I can make the vaccine, but I want to test the vaccine where there's the problem we are lacking. Actually. And the other important about any vaccine, that any emerging disease, uh, you need to sequence the, the virus. And this is what's happened when the virus appeared in China. The first step they did is to report it. And there was a delay in the time to report the disease. And who report this? They report the clinicians. When they see a patient with the, some pulmonary disease, like you're talking about pneumonia, and he is uh, hospitalized to ICU, then that is what is called a variant of concern. And actually, the WHO recommends that you report that. So the first thing you need to do, you need to collect the sample. You have to sequence it. If you don't have the sequencing facility, you have to send it abroad for CDC in US. And they can sequence it for you. And they want to identify whether this is a new virus strain. And if it is a new virus strain, the WHO will issue a, a, like a lockdown to that country, to that village, to, us, to that city, so the disease will not spread widely. Now, why we want to sequence here uh, uh, in the, the viruses, because in Oman, actually, we already managed to have 205 genomes sequenced for the Omani patient. And currently, I'm actually going to upload new viruses, 40 more. So I'm talking about new, new cases that actually we sequence in the whole genome sequencing. So this is what we're going to report now. And there is actually a GSA. This is actually a website we created. So scientists around the world, they actually report their genome sequences. Now, why this is important? why we need to report our viral sequences. 
It's important, number one, because you want to develop diagnostic accuracy, because in most of this, it depends on the real-time real PCR, where you design primers. So we design primer against the S gene, you put two primers, and you design on the N gene, you put two primers. And this is actually for diagnosis, because if there is a change in the mutation somewhere here, this will not be amplified. So that's why in many diagnostic, we need the genomic sequences and also to identify a region where there is no change. So if there is a change in the mutation here, I don't design my primer on this mutation because otherwise this PCR will not work. So you have the virus, but your PCR comes negative. So that's why you need uh, many company, countries, they want to report new variants because if you have a new variance and the current diagnostic kit does not work with that, then this is a problem. And this actually happened. If you see the UK variant that came, the UK variant, the mutation is on the primer sequence for one of the commercial kits. So that's why how to identify the UK variant. Basically, you get the patient who is positive in this, in this gene, is positive in the N gene, but he's negative on the spike gene. And then you send this sample for sequencing, and then you tell you, actually, this was the UK variant. So that's what we use for the current uh, model. And the other important part of this actually is the uh, is the uh, let me just the thing. So the other important part is the development of vaccine, and this is why I want I'm actually more interested in. It. So the more sequencing you put in the database, it will help the companies because there are companies actually developing this messenger RNA for the spike protein, and they try to develop a messenger RNA away from the mutation side. Because if you have a mutation, this vaccine might not work for that virus strain, for that vari variant. Uh, so there's therefore that you see in the news, whenever a vaccine, a new variant comes, you say the second question in the media, is this uh, variant ca is covered by this vaccine? And the company will come another day because they have the sequences. They will say, okay, our vaccine is still efficient uh, against this strain because the mutation occur outside the region of the messenger RNA that we have designed. And that's why many companies, they design multiple messenger RNA, not single form. And this is actually to cover a lot of uh, uh, vaccine. Now, the second problem that we want to talk about is actually in the development of vaccine is the efficiency testing. And here actually in Oman, we don't have a, a facility. So we can design the vaccine, but we cannot test its efficiency because you need for animal facility, you need a specific pathogen free, Currently, the animal lab we have in Oman, we have two animal labs that we can do experiments. Uh, in SQU, is actually, and also in the other university, in Nisbe University, is not a specific pathogen free. Uh, so this is actually, we don't have, we have a lab, but it's not a specific pathogen, pathogen free. And also we need a biosafety level. Currently, our biosafety level is two. We don't have biosafety level three. We don't have biosafety level four. And we also humanized model, we don't have them now here. And uh, so that's why the only biosafety level two is available. Biosafety level three cabinet does exist in the university, but it's not the room. So you need actually the facility to be biosafety level three, not only the cabinet. Uh, so a lot of laboratory facility, you need an approval body because if I want to test the vaccine, I need to do clinical trials. We don't have an approval body here. We don't have like the FDA, we only go for FDA, but many countries, they have their own approval bodies. Like in Saudi, they do have, in Korea, they have their own approval. In India, they have their own approval body. In Oman, we don't have an approval body. If anybody designed a drug in Oman, if you want to approve it, you have to go abroad. You have to go abroad, and then you can go to FDA to approve it for you for phase one and phase two. And also, we don't have a clinical trial centers. This is something we lack in our hospital. We, we do have like a clinics which are already ordinary clinic in the hospital, but these are not a specialized center where patient comes to give blood and you can collect and you can test the efficacy of the vaccine. So that's something we actually, we, we are lacking. Now in, in SQ, we have actually now a proposal. We submit the proposal through the medical research center to talk about this uh, uh, establishing a biosafety level three and even biosafety level four in the future. And this uh, proposal actually to cover and actually to put vaccination as part of one, because in this biosafety level, it's not only for vaccination. In any time in the future, if you get any pathogen, we need a place to actually grow this pathogen. Currently, we don't have, and that's the main problem. So there is a proposal that is actually we sent, but you know, as always, the proposal, you need budget for that. So we're not sure whether we're gonna get the budget or not. 
uh, in this figure, I'm just showing the neutralization assay. You can see here the neutralization assay. Uh, basically, you inject the animal or you inject the human with the with the uh, with the antigen, and then you're gonna get the serum where they have the antibody, and you load the serum in the well. The third step, you add the virus, and this is the problem. You need a biosafety level three. We don't have this. So currently, we don't have this. Also, for I think it's one of the requirement was maybe Dr. Arwa can help me later on. For the plasma exchange therapy, when you want to give the you know plasma to the patient, you need to test whether those plasma that the donor is giving you has antibody. Because at the end of the day, you need passive immunity. You need good antibodies in the donor, so you need to test for that. So you need this neutralization assay. And as I said, the assay is not difficult. The only thing here, you need a biosafety level uh, level. I'm just here trying to go very fast. There are different biosafety level three. I'm just showing you pictures. You can see the protection, the personal protection, PPEs, and the incubators, like how you can access this. And this is the whole room, actually. You can see the whole room is actually a biosafety level three, not only the cabinet. We do have this cabinet, but we don't have the whole room. And you don't need a big facility. You just need few rooms for biosafety level three. I'm just showing you the experiment. Biosafety level four is much more advanced. And here, actually, you need a higher security level. I know some countries, they are not allowed to have this. There are some countries when they have allowed, it's actually controlled by the police. It's not controlled by the, by the hospital. It's controlled by higher levels, you know, in the security in the country. Because here we're talking about more uh, dangerous uh, pathogens, uh, like Ebola virus, you need biosafety level four. I can see the protection level is different, like the suit is different. You'll be connected with the pipe to your suit, the oxygen that it comes to your body is all filtered. So nothing comes out of this room. So it has to stay there. And you know the, the building material is different because for sterilization purpose. So that's why all this, uh, it needs a lot of uh, setup and the cost is very high. So that's something that we don't have. Now, the other thing also important, and this is actually why Oman is not getting the vaccine, that if I design a vaccine and I found that it is good, I need to establish what is called a good manufacturing practice. We don't have this GMP. It's not about producing the vaccine. This GMP that this vial is actually has is a with the contamination. There is a quality check. Uh, how much is the endotoxin levels is there? You need to test. And this product is reliable. The amount of vaccine here is almost same here to the other vial. And this is a called quality. So no cross contamination. Reliable product. It's safe to use. No endotoxin. It does not have any contaminants that can affect the patient. And the purity is regulated. And this is all called good manufacturing practice. Uh, and this is actually where the many companies and countries having a problem and you need large scale production. And if you wonder a German company that can produce the vaccine, why they went to Pfizer? Because they need a good GMP lab. In Oman, we don't have a good GMP lab. So that's why we do have actually for the pharmaceutical companies, but if you want large scale, that's why you see small universities, small companies, they can design for you, but when it comes to large scale production, they go for a company that actually specializes in this. In India, there is a lab. You can see Oxford, when they designed, they went to India for synthesis because the, the Bharat Biotechnology is a large center actually is used to synthesize a lot of vaccine, not only for Corona, but, but all other vaccines. So you need to collaborate. You need to partner with the big companies which are specialized in GMP and they are specialized in large scale production. So that's what I think will be my last slide. So whenever you see a pathogen, number one step, you need to do genomic sequencing. And you need to share this genomic sequencing because this was one of the fear in the Corona COVID at the early beginning. Many companies, they want to design primers and they want to utilize the testing facility because if this sequence was secret, only companies have access, they pay for that. They can pay 1 million a month yeah, to get the sequence. And they can design kits that you don't know what is the sequence of that kit. But luckily, there was data sharing. Uh, the Chinese uh, university, I think Beijing Institute, they actually made it available online for everybody. Then you can design primer for diagnosis. And also you can design vaccines. You can produce large scale mRNA. And then you can put the GMP vials. And then you go for large scale vaccination where you can actually get herd immunity in the future. So that was my part. I hope I finished in the, within the time. Uh, thank you very much. I welcome any question or maybe later on or during the talk right now. Thank you very much, Dr. Fahad. 
for your excellent presentation. <clears throat> we will going to have questions after the next speaker. So please stay behind. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Arwa Zakria Al Riyami. She is senior consultant and histopathologist, Department of Hematology, Sultan Qaboos University Hospital. She is also the program director of Hematopathology Residency Program at Oman Medical Specialty Board. Her topic of talk tonight is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on blood supplies and transfusion services in Eastern Mediterranean region. Your talk, uh, you please complete your talk in 20 minutes and welcome Dr. Arwa Riyami. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sherman. I would like to start by thanking the National um, University for the kind invitation. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Adil Bimani, and uh, um, for this invitation. Um, I'm a senior consultant hematopathologist uh, working in the Department of Hematology at the Sultan Qaboos University Hospital. It's not a very common uh, specialty. Um, but um, I basically diagnosed hematological disorders, and I'm also uh, primarily working in the blood bank, the Sultan Qaboos University uh, blood bank. Um, so uh, today, I'm impact of COVID-19 pandemic on blood supplies and transfusion services in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, region. This is a project that I did in collaboration and support from uh, the um, office of uh, EMRO region and the WHO in Cairo. Uh, so just to start up with, uh, we basically know that COVID-19 pandemic is one of the worst um, uh, viral uh, disasters that basically been seen in the, in the 20th century. In the Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, the first cases were reported in the United Arab Emirates on the 29th of January. And this was followed by uh, multiple cases that were reported uh, in February in Egypt, Iran, and the rest of the countries uh, followed in February and March. And the last report was from Yemen uh, in April. Um, you can see here, this is the latest uh, WHO situation or report uh, on the number of cases of COVID um, uh, worldwide. And you can see in Imra region, we have uh, at the moment, about 6 million cases that were reported and about 140,000 um, deaths uh, that uh, occurred due to COVID um, uh, pandemic. Now, what, what is the impact of that? So, we, we've all gone through this and we know the, uh, the calls for the governments for everyone to stay home um, and to try and uh, maintain social distancing. And um, this had a, a potential major impact that we started facing in the blood banks uh, here locally as well as uh, internationally. So, when these calls basically go out uh, in order to control this virus threats, this obviously would adversely affect the blood system activities. Um, it affects your uh, donors, it affects how donors can uh, reach out to the blood banks as well as the different donation campaigns to donate blood. It affects your staff management as staff could be infected with COVID-19 and that results into staff loss. It also affects the workload as we were required to reduce number of staffing for social distancing and that can put a lot of um, um, workload uh, on certain staff. It adversely affects blood supply by decreasing donations and blood drive cancellation and the lockdown. It impacts the safety of everyone, including the staff, the donors, as well as the components, considering that you are talking about the new virus that we don't know much about early in the pandemic. Um, it also impacts uh, reagent supplies to many blood banks worldwide, uh, supplies of consumables with the closure of the airports, as well as equipment maintenance in case of breakdown. And it impacts communication, communication with the public, the leaders, with other institutions and organizations. So when we looked at the first reports that came out from uh, the first uh, uh, countries that were affected by COVID-19, uh, we've seen that in China, for instance, there was a 67% drop in blood donors. 80% were worried of the possibility of acquiring COVID-19 infection during blood donation. In Japan, they had a lower percentage of drop of about 30%. 
that's also was lower in Italy. And in fact, uh, Italy was one of the countries that report increased donations, uh, even during the later stages of the first wave of the COVID um, pandemic. In the Netherlands, on the other hand, they had an initial surge in number of donations in response to the uh, pandemic. So you can see different populations and nations responded very differently to this pandemic. Um, and, and that basically brought up the idea of saying uh, what could have this pandemic impacted the country in the region. The WHO has released an interim guidance um, in response to this, uh, considering the potential impact on the supply of, of blood and blood components. And this guidance have gone into several revisions, as you can see down there. Uh, but it is very consistent throughout. So blood services must be prepared in order to move quickly in response to changes during which blood sufficiency is most likely to be affected. There are different components in here, including mitigating the potential risk of transmission through transfusion of blood and blood components. Could COVID-19, for instance, or SARS-CoV-2 be transmitted through transfusion if um, a donor was infected or had a sub uh, clinical infection during donation, how to mitigate the risk of staff and donor exposure to COVID-19 virus, how to mitigate the impact on reduced availability of blood donors, how to manage the demand for blood and blood product during this period, and how to prevent the disruption in the supplies and the critical materials and equipments, and all other components also related to communication and consideration of thrombolysis and plasma, which many blood banks worldwide started to be enrolled in really early before even knowing the efficiency and safety of thrombolysis uh, and plasma. So the aim of this uh, was to assess the impact of this pandemic on the blood supply and transfusion demands really in the first three months of the pandemic. That's the first hit uh, that we all had faced. To address the donor and staff and blood inventory demand management and see what we learned from each other and how did we manage to go through that early phase of, of the pandemic and share these learning lessons also with other international uh, um, readers. So the participating blood banks were 22. There were 22 representatives of blood bank from 19 uh, regions in the country. They were invited. We had representations from 16 centers who responded, which gave up a, uh, a total of 72 percent response rate, and you can see here the representations from the different countries in the region. We, out of these, there were 12 national blood banks that cover blood supply for the whole nation uh, altogether. Type of donations in these were variable, so voluntary donations was common among all of these blood banks. However, 14 had also family replacement donations, and seven had also directed donations. There were five blood banks that had other sources of blood other than the local collections. All centers also uh, have reported that they have applied a specific eligibility criteria of deferring donor during COVID-19. So when we looked at um, the percentage of decrease in blood supply and potential decrease in blood demand. I mean, we know that during COVID-19 pandemic, many surgeries got canceled, many hospitals were converted to COVID hospitals, so that potentially could have decreased the demand. So we were interested in, in assessing that as well. And we assessed uh, in, in line with that, the percent and the number of confirmed cases at the time of the survey in each of these countries that participated. So you can see here, if we look at the supply, there was a quite a range. There were countries like the United Arab Emirates who did not had a marked decrease in the supply, less than 10%, while other countries have gone as high as 50 to 75% decrease in blood donation and blood supply. Now, in terms of the decrease in the demand, again, that was very variable. So we have countries that had less than 10% decrease in demand, which means that they really struggled in maintaining the blood supply for at the time where there was no decrease in the demand or minimum decrease in the demand. In Bahrain and Oman, our demand actually remained the same in our institution at SQUH. And in Bahrain, it actually increased by about 10 to 25 percent. And that could be related to um, uh, many factors uh, that are beyond discussion in this talk. Now, uh, this is also about for other countries, and I want to highlight countries that are under humanitarian uh, disasters like Palestine and Yemen. So you can see here the decrease in the blood supply was um, up to 50% in Palestine. 
as for Yemen, it was less than 10% in the early stage, and we know Yemen was the last country to report COVID altogether. But again, there is variation with the degree of decrease in demand. Now, when we looked at the reasons of that, uh, most of the centers have reported that there is a public fear from contracting COVID-19. Uh, cancellation of the blood drive was very common among all these uh, blood banks. Um, and that's because of different reasons, including social distancing calls, as well as uh, closure of universities, closure of colleges, um, and minimizing workforce in many governmental and private institutions. There is also decrease in number of in-house blood donations and decreased number of donors that are visiting the blood banks. Government request to the community stay, to stay home without a parallel uh, message to them that blood donation is a necessity and it can be uh, um, considered as a priority in a situation of this. Um, lockdown, closure of roads was another common uh, issue that we faced in the region and decreased number of eligible donors because of COVID infection or contact of patients with COVID or even history of trouble. Those are all additional eligibility criteria that we had to instate uh, in accepting donors for donation. Now, we, and with regards to blood demand, cancellation of elective surgeries and major procedures was very common. So everyone had these cancellations that took place. There is also decrease in admissions to hospitals to majority of the, of the countries, closure of the wards and the hospitals. Um, and, and for these centers that had similar or increased demand, like in Oman, in Bahrain, Lebanon, and Yemen, the common thing about these centers is that they were supplying patients with hemoglobinopathies and patients with blood cancers and solid malignancies. So this is the group of patients that really had same, if not more demand during COVID-19 pandemic and really struggled in order to uh, maintain their demands uh, and blood requirement during this um, pandemic. Now, what, what, what were the measures to overcome the shortages? Uh, all, of, all, of the, all of the blood banks have reported that they have intensified donor recruitment and mobilization. Um, Ten had to activate their emergency and disaster plan. Nine have collaborated with military and governmental institutions. Um, there were eight that actually managed to continue with the blood donation drives, and I found that that was a very good um, uh, move to continue with these drives likely being supported even by the government. Donor transportation was offered in a couple of countries, and these are donors that were co collected from their homes and brought up to the blood centers to donate blood and then returned back home. So that is the extreme whereby blood banks had to, to go uh, in order to maintain blood supply. Home blood collections also took place in Palestine, Saudi Arabia, as well as in Pakistan. Now, four centers have reported to change the donor eligibility criteria, and we were one of them. Um, we had three centers had reduced uh, whole blood donation intervals for donors with robust hemoglobin level. So at the moment at SQUH, if a male donor comes to donate blood, they are allowed to do that every two months rather than three months. And this is supported by the guidance that came out from the WHO. Now, learning lessons with regards on donors and how to deal with donors. I think it's very important that uh, blood banks have to assess the requirements daily, mobilize blood donors based on specific components and needs, and that's what most of these blood banks have reported to do. Utilize the spacious community centers like sport halls as extra donation sites uh, where the public may feel more safe to go and donate rather than going to the hospitals um, to, to donate blood in hospital-affiliated blood banks. Collecting donations from areas or cities that are less affected by the pandemic, so that's if you have a mobile ability to do that, then you can go out of the city and collect from areas that are less affected. Mobilizing regular and repeat donors was found to be very effective in this situation because these donors know the importance of the donation and they can maintain it. Utilize volunteers and community groups in mobilizing donors, and we actually had a very good support from uh, the university students, from uh, other, other colleges also have helped in uh, recruiting blood donors through social media panels in order to come and donate blood in our blood bank. Mobilizing hospital staff for blood donation early in the pandemic before they get exposed to more patients, because before they get infected with COVID, 
um, and assessing regularly the governmental decisions on travel restrictions and lockdown. And I think this is one of the most important challenges that we had, that the higher committee here had to do weekly decisions in order to try and control the, the, the viral spread. And with every decision of that, we had to act upon in, in the blood bank. Maintain a communication with the authorities in order to maintain donor access during lockdown. So we actually, our experience was that we had to issue letters and send these letters by WhatsApp to the donors in order to confirm that they have an appointment to the blood bank uh, for donation so that they can go through the lockdown security and, and reach the blood bank. So the learning lessons that also the blood bank directors have said is that you have to be proactive in communicating with the public on the need of blood donors, even in a situation like this. You need to educate the public that blood donation is safe during COVID-19 and it is in need. Um, and you need to gain their confidence with all the measures that you do in the blood banks in order to um, uh, control the spread of the virus and maintain the safety of your donors and the staff. You need to use different communication channels while doing that, including TV, radio, social media, um, and try and reach out to the maximum level to the public. You need to maintain a strong continuous message throughout this uh, pandemic. And you might need also to use mass text messages, and we have done that through the different telecom um, uh, companies in here to reach out to the public. Uh, collaboration of public figures and influencers, like for instance at SQUH, we have uh, blood bank ambassadors, um, important figures in the society that took our voice to the public and tried to recruit them to come and donate blood. Uh, you have to utilize different languages, so that's the other thing you have to remember. And there are uh, different nations that are present, so you need to address um, all different um, um, uh, nations while you are trying to recruit donors. And consider a hotline in addressing public concerns. As for inventory, it's very important to obtain supplies from areas or cities that are not affected from the pandemic. Collaborate with other blood banks and instate a redistribution program. Try and work in collaboration in order to cover needs. Discuss with key stakeholders on measures on how to minimize blood use and, and basically use it for patients who are in real in real need. Um, secure a sustainable and safe blood supply to meet transfusion demands for certain group of patients. And here in Oman, I highlight patients with thalassemia, sickle cell disease, patients with blood cancers and solid malignancies. As for contingency, you have to have an alternative blood collection and testing facilities. This is very important if you have a lockdown, like what happened here. We had a complete lockdown of Muscat region, uh, and even in Muscat, we had also lockdown of certain cities to collaborate with military and civil society, and we had a, a, an important support from there. Uh, establish a web-based infrastructure to coordinate inventory management at the national level, and this is a very important um, uh, a success story that came from Morocco in controlling the demand of the country. Control messages through the use of social media and the community. Keep the clinicians and the administrators in perspective of the status on a regular basis because everyone is busy with COVID and COVID patients, but there are other patients who are also in need, including the COVID patients. Review the blood bank contingency and disaster actions as you're doing this. As I said, for, for all of us, this is the first time that we go through a pandemic like this. And so the plans that had we had in place uh, in managing a disaster would need to change based on the experience that you have, because there are different levels of disasters. And, and with experience, you would know that um, things may work differently for different types of disasters. So with that, I would like to acknowledge everyone who contributed to the uh, to this uh, lesson learned uh, project. Uh, this was just published uh, recently, and it's actually one of the um, uh, papers that went out on, on lessons learned. The only one that came out from this region, we have other papers that came out from other regions, such as Africa and the Eastern uh, Southeast Asia. So we are very good um, and very uh, happy that we were able also to share the experience that we had in this region in this matter. With that, I would like to conclude and I would like to remind everyone since uh, we had an important topic prior to me on vaccination. Um, if you've been vaccinated for COVID-19, you still can donate blood. You can do that seven days after the vaccination. 
And if you had COVID, you still can donate blood. You can do that um, after 14 days uh, after recovery and clearance of all signs of symptoms. It's very important to take the message to the public that blood donation is a necessity. It's important. It has to continue. Um, and we have to take it as we go through the pandemic. So with every um, decision that is made in order to control the spread of, of this um, virus, we have also to remember that there are other patients who are in need of blood and blood components and there is no replacement for blood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Arwa al Riyami, a hematopathologist at the Sultan Qaboos University. Now we will going to start the uh, question answer session so i hope dr fahad you are also with us so yeah yeah so there are a lot of questions about this uh, vaccination so i will start reading the first one <clears throat> uh, there have been reports of severe infection after sinopharm vaccine is it a live att attenuated vaccine where the inactivation may have failed or was in efficient yes uh, actually this is very important when you use a life attenuated vaccine one of the problems as i mentioned in my powerpoint is actually that um, i mean it depends on the individual immune system uh, this life attenuated vaccine it might cause the disease and uh, and this is actually happens with other life attenuated vaccine so there is a risk so one of the disadvantage of this life attenuated that it can induce the disease in the in the individual yeah Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, what is the advantage of using a, a messenger RNA vaccine for COVID-19 instead of DNA vaccine? Yes, so as I mentioned, I actually already covered this. So in the, when you talk about the DNA vaccine and the mRNA, the advantage of the mRNA is actually there is a less risk of uh, integration in the genome. And there was a talk, you know, if you see the, you know, the, the social media, you said, you know, don't take the vaccine, you're going to develop a tail, you know, you become an animal <laughs> because they think that you become a genetically modified organism. But yeah, I mean, that was one of the people who read on the scientific paper and they see genomic integration. And once they see this genomic integration sentence, they can speculate a lot of stuff, you know, they are changing human. They are going to, the companies are going to change as the vaccine companies, but no, uh, actually that's one of the, uh, the integration on the genome is random. It's not mm -hmm. like a specifically go to a right. And this is actually, uh, if, you, if you see the gene therapy, actually there are some gene therapy, therapy, especially hematological disorders and immunological disorders are already been approved by FDA. One of the disadvantages of gene therapy, if you can integrate your, your DNA into anywhere in the genome, it can affect genes or it can actually affect regions which are actually crucial for the human living. And there was one case report where the one of the gene therapy, actually the individual developed type 1 diabetes and because it was inserted in the insulin gene, the, the new cassette. So yes, uh, the mRNA vaccine is, has some advantages. Uh, and the, the problem with the mRNA vaccine, when it comes to efficacy, uh, it, they are less antigenic compared to the DNA vaccine. So that's why the companies who make DNA vaccine, their promotion or their marketing would be, oh, our efficiency is much better. Mm. But how much is efficiency? As I said, I mean, uh, most of the vaccine, the most important outcome we look at is not how much antibody you generate. It's actually how much you prevent uh, severe disease. It's not how much you prevent the infection, but I want to prevent severity. That's actually, if you see, there is a, there was one paper, it came out comparing the current vaccine because many people, they said, okay, I'm not going to take the Oxford vaccine. I'm going to take the, the Pfizer vaccine. Pfizer vaccine. But forget the other column which says that what is the efficacy in severity all of them were 100 percent so mm. so that's what the you need you know you need the you know the awareness to be raised to the community because community are now exposed to media and they might get misinformation like wrong information because they see number they see 95 and they see the other one is 85 for example they okay say 95 is better than 85 but, but what was the efficacy test? You should look at the right efficacy test is to prevent the severe disease rather than preventing the infection. Yeah. Yes, very good. So the next question also connected with this, why MOH does not check if the immunized people develop antibodies against COVID-19 after the second dose? So have you checked um, what is the... Uh, Actually, this was part of the clinical trials when it was done in the phase two and phase three of the, of the vaccine. 
But why the MOH here does not do it is basically to allocate resources on other things rather than, you know, I mean, because you already have the data. I mean, instead of checking antibodies, the MOH now is people who got vaccinated, they are followed up whether they get the infection and the severity. Because part of this in the phase four trials, the clinical trials, when you go post marketing, you need to report any adverse reaction or report the efficacy in every country, but not to measure the antibody because this is another resource, another cost. You need people, you need labs, and the labs already now busy with the travelers, busy with the current variants. So it's, I think it's more of a, you know directing your resources for better service rather than measuring antibody. They're measuring how much infection they got and how many people who are vaccinated getting the disease rather than measuring the antibody itself. Yeah, okay. How could vaccines be validated against new mutation and what uh, efficacy in this case be assessed? Yeah, so the one of the things they do actually is the, the manufacturing company, they are the one who are testing this. So number one, the one of the things which is very simple is to check the sequence. You know, when the company, they develop the vaccine, as I said, they have the sequence of the of the RNA or the DNA. So from that sequence, if that mutation occurs in that sequence, then the company will say, okay, we're going to do some laboratory tests. And the most simple laboratory test is to do neutralization assay. So basically, they have the viral strain, they culture it, and they're going to check whether the antibody from the mouse, the humanized mouse or the monkey, it can be neutralized, or they can take the plasma of the individual who are infected and uh, like, you know, vaccinated, you can see the neutralization of that. Assay. So there are ways to do it. And actually, it is done by the manufacturer uh, company and that's why you see in the news is the manufacturer company comes and they declare that our vaccine is still effective so currently we hear that most of the vaccine actually is still efficient yeah oman could actually make oman specific vaccine but are we genetically unique are the omani people genetically unique <laughs> this is like a, a general question but actually we are talking about the virus itself here we're not talking about yes, the individual about so so the virus sequence, the virus, uh, I think most of, the, as I said, we in Oman, we already sequenced around 205. So now we are almost 245. Uh, we do sequence, we do have the facility to do genomic sequencing in Oman. And we actually do report the sequences to, it's basically to report the variants. So currently our efforts now is actually to, uh, instead of doing whole genome sequencing, we just target the variants. And if there is, and I I'm always say, I mean, until when we're going to sequence the variants, because every time there is a new variant coming yeah, up. Yes. And this is a natural process for the virus. The virus do change, and it can change to a weaker one, which is good. And this is what is the natural history of the virus. Uh, or it can change to something which is more transmittable or more pathogenic, more uh, efficacy. But here we are not talking about the human variation. We're talking about the virus uh, genetic variation. Yeah. But when it comes to human, uh, yeah, there is a lot of genetic variability, and we do see we actually have a database of Oman variant, uh, and this is actually not declared and not published. But the, uh, our, we do have in you know, Omani Omani population, or also the Arabic population, we have different allele frequency in different genes, so it's not always the same. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so the last question for you is that was antisense RNA exploited as a cleaner approach to COVID nineteen rather than vaccination? Yeah, the antisense RNA, they are very small, uh, small, like short, like 20 nucleotides or even less. Uh, and basically, if you need to use it as a treatment, actually, there is a paper now uh, we, because we have one of the TRC funded projects to look at the antisense RNA in the severe and moderate disease. And uh, so we do have a database. We know which mRNA goes up, which micro RNA uh, goes down. And those micro RNAs, actually, we can uh, use them whether like there are something called uh, mRNA mimics and uh, an MMRA inhibitory MI microRNA that we can use, but this are will be used either to reduce the severity of the disease, but it cannot be used to prevent the virus because the load of the virus could be very high and the amount of RNA used antisense would not be sufficient for to combat them. But in terms of reducing severity, yes, there are some already paper came out, but nobody investigated that. Okay. okay, Dr. Fahd, thank you very much for your time. Now we have a few questions for Dr. Arwa. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Arwa, uh, one uh, presenter saying back salute to you for your commitment and impressive efforts during this harsh time. So the question is, is it safe for an ex-COVID to donate blood? Dr. Arwa. Yes, uh, so 
Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I mean, this is uh, this is a duty that we have for for the patients. So thank you very much for the person who raised this comment. And everyone can actually be part of this. It's a very difficult time for all blood banks to go through um, trying to educate the public. At the same time, everyone has been asked to stay home, to avoid social distancing, um, to avoid gatherings, and all that. And and I think it's it's very important that you have a parallel uh, message that is really strong and really consistent, taken by everyone. It doesn't have to be a blood banker to to take this message to the community that this is the necessity. And it's very important that we we maintain that message throughout. So thank you very much for the comment. And I I really wish that this uh, message can be taken through uh, everyone who attends this, this uh, talk. To their, to their families, to their friends, to their peers, in order to to um, support the blood banks in this coming um, wave of COVID. As so, for the so question with regards to uh, past infection, yes, COVID nineteen or SARS CoV two to be accurate is a viral uh, is a virus. So and it is basically a respiratory virus. Um, up to now, there is no evidence that says that this virus can be transmitted through blood and blood components. Uh, so donors who had past history of infection uh, by COVID-19 or respiratory uh, symptoms that may be suspicious of COVID-19, we ask them to wait before they come and donate blood. Um, as a precautionary measure and also to maintain the safety of the blood banks because there are other people who are in the blood bank as well as other donors and, and these people should technically be in a quarantine phase. Now, early in the pandemic, we used to ask them to wait for 28 days before they come to the blood banks and donate. The recent WHO have revised that criteria down to 14 days, which is very similar to our quarantine criteria. So 14 days after recovery, uh, resolution of signs and symptoms, um, and cessation of a, any treatment after that, a uh, person can donate blood safely. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Arwa. There's one, uh, one question for Dr. Fahad again, that new researchers say infected people need only uh, one dose. Why still they get two doses? Dr. Fahad. Sorry. Yes, sorry, I have to unmute myself. Well, uh, the booster dose, or what you call it, all depends on the vaccine uh, efficiency. Uh, what's happened is that, you know, the incubation period is also very important for each pathogen. Uh, you can see some of the vaccines like hepatitis B, you need to at least two or three uh, doses. In uh, some of the other vaccine, you only need one. It all depends on the, on the vaccine efficiency. So basically, when you inject the first uh, dose of the vaccine, you're going to measure the amount of the antibody, like the level of the antibody, and there is a threshold. If your first dose uh, produce antibody below that threshold, the company will recommend that okay after three weeks or four weeks you can take other dose so you, until your antibody goes to above threshold. So sometimes it's actually all depends on the company. As I said, the company when they design the vaccine, they design different type and different actually forms and different stabilizer, different types of adjuvants. There are different types of adjuvants actually used. And for the coronavirus, there is one is called lipo. I forgot the name of that adjuvant. We use commonly use it actually in, in for uh, RNA vaccine. So in that actually depends how much it induces your antibody protection. If the antibody protection were very good in the first dose, then the company will say, okay, one dose is more than enough. And that's why you see some of the company they actually they came up. They said, okay, single dose is more than enough. You don't have to take a two dose. It all depends how much antibody is produced from your body. Thank you very much, Dr. Fahad and Dr. Arwa. Uh, now I would like to uh, give the speaker to Aisha, so you can start with the next session for the research presentation. Ms. Aisha, please. Thank you, Dr. Nachan. We'll now continue with the next session for today's event, which is on research presentations. Each presentation will be for 15 minutes. Our first presentation for today is by Ms. Mariam al Isai. She is an MD6 student from College of Medicine and Health Sciences, Sultan Qaboos University. And her topic today is clinical presentation, demographics and outcome in patients admitted with moderate to severe COVID-19, Middle Eastern country multicentric data. Welcome, Maria. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Maryam Al-Isa'i, sixth year medical student uh, and, uh, at Sultan Qaboos University. Uh, and today I'll be presenting about our research titled Cardiovascular Manifestations and Outcomes in Patients Admitted with Severe COVID-19. Uh, it is supervised by Dr. Fahed Al-Kindi, Senior Consultant Cardiologist at Sultan Qaboos University Hospital. And he's as well the principal investigator. Uh, I'd, uh, he's here with us today, and uh, I'd like to thank him for giving me and my colleagues the opportunity to be uh, in this big research. Uh, my uh, colleagues are uh, medical students as well. They're at uh, Sultan Qaboos University, Maathar Al-Abri and Shahab Al-Kindi. Uh, both of, uh, both of yeah, all of us, uh, our role was mainly focused on data collection from three different uh, hospitals. Now, uh, starting with a brief introduction, as we all know that the first uh, reported case of COVID-19 was in Wuhan, uh, China in December uh, 2019, uh, uh, which then rapidly spread to the countries around the world to be declared as a global pandemic in March 2020. Uh, while, for the, while for the Middle Eastern region, uh, the first reported case of COVID-19 was in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, while for Oman, uh, the first reported case was in February 24 from two citizens returning from Iran. Now, uh, it's known that SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, predominantly affects the lung. Uh, however, it's also found to have a tendency to affect the cardiovascular system. Uh, and that's where the virus uses its spike protein on its envelope to attach to ACE receptor, which is found in uh, many organs, uh, including the heart. And it also directly affects the heart and endothelium, causing myocarditis, black rupture, thrombotic occlusion of the, coron uh, of the coronaries uh, uh, due to its procoagulant uh, action. Uh, in addition to that, a pre-existing cardiovascular disease and risk factors such as hypertension contributes to higher mortality. Uh, and this takes us to the aim of our study, which is to assess the impact of COVID-19 on the cardiovascular system and the outcomes and mortality based uh, on the involvement of the cardiovascular system, specifically among patients admitted to the ICU in Oman. Uh, our study is a retrospective multicenter study involving three tertiary hospitals, Sultan Qaboos University Hospital, Royal Hospital, and the Nahda Hospital. And uh, that's actually the beauty of our study, uh, is that it's involving three major hospitals in Oman, and that's not very common to have a study involving these three big hospitals. Uh, we included all adult patients aged 18 and above with a positive PCR and who were admitted to the ICU between the period of uh, 1st of March 2020 to the 10th of August 2020. And this is the period chosen because at that time the numbers uh, started to dramatically increase and the uh, intensive care units were filled uh, with the uh, COVID positive patients. Um, on the other hand, uh, patients who were confirmed to have COVID-19 but did not require ICU care and uh, did not uh, require hospitalizations were not uh, included in the study. Uh, of course, ethical approval was obtained separately from each participating center. And now, uh, as for the data collection, it was uh, extracted retrospectively from electronic health record systems from the participating centers. Uh, the data included uh, the demographics of the patients, uh, any comorbidities, how did these patients present uh, their laboratory findings, any complications, therapeutic measures and outcomes, and as well as the cardiac manifestations in these patients. Uh, we recorded almost all the cardiac manifestations of these patients, and this included an elevated cardiac biomarkers, acute myocardial injury, myocardial infarction, myocarditis, arrhythmias, congestive heart failure, and cardiogenic shock. Uh, and then the data was transferred to a pre-specified uh, electronic sheet. Now, uh, moving, to, moving to our results. This table shows the clinical characteristics of the study patients. Uh, we included 541 patients, and out of these patients, 34% had, cardio, uh, had cardiovascular involvement. 
with a mean age of 50%. However, when it comes to the age, uh, uh, those with cardiovascular involvement were found to be 13 years older than those without uh, cardiovascular involvement. Uh, as for the gender, uh, there is a male predominance, it is 74.1%, uh, uh, while for the nationality, uh, the number of Omani patients was higher, uh, it was 54.3%, uh, and out of these, 58.3% had cardiovascular involvement, and the rest were non-Omani. However, um, like although like at the beginning of this study, the number of non-Omani patients was actually higher, but then it got reversed. And this can be explained by the rapid, uh, rapid spread of the virus among the families. Um, we also noticed that uh, for patients who have, for patients with cardiovascular uh, involvement, they were more likely to have uh, diabetes. And this was in 64.3% uh, of the patients followed by hypertension, which was 58.3%, and then dyslipidemia, which was 23.7%. Uh, and uh, for the presenting symptoms, um, it's known that for uh, patients with mild COVID-19, uh, the more uh, they're more likely to present uh, with the uh, cough, uh, myalgia, and shortness of breath. However, uh, we noticed that in ICU patients, uh, they are more they have fever as the most common presenting symptom, which was in 77.1 percent, and uh, followed by uh, shortness of breath, which was 72.8 uh, percent, uh, and then cough being 68.9 percent. Uh, and uh, among these, uh, for patients who had cardiovascular involvement, uh, fever was also the commonest presenting uh, symptom, which was in 68.6 percent of the patients, and cough, which was in 60 percent of uh, these patients. Now, um, in the loss of smell and taste, we had uh, five. Uh, we had uh, a number. Uh, of 5%. However, uh, this does not reflect the actual numbers because uh, this uh, this is not something uh, measured. Uh, it's more of uh, something to obtain from the history. And uh, as we know, like uh, the patients involved in our study are ICU patients, and uh, most of them are being intubated. Uh, now, uh, as uh, as I mentioned previously, is that uh, thirty four percent of our patients had cardiovascular involvement, and it actually uh, our study confirms what has been uh, published internationally, and it is found to be uh, from seven to forty percent of the patients. Uh, in fact, these patients uh, had a higher mortality rate, reaching 86.5%. Uh, uh, and with that, uh, we also found that the most common um, uh, cardiac manifestation was uh, myocardial injury. And uh, this was reflected as uh, raised levels of troponin. And that was in 31.6% of, of the patients. And these had a high. Uh, this was contributed to contributed to a significantly high mortality rate, reaching to sixty seventy six point four percent, which is uh, almost seven times higher. Uh, other cardiac manifestations were uh, arrhythmia and cardiogenic shock. Uh, arrhythmia contributed to nineteen point one percent mortality rate, while cardiogenic shock. Uh, contributed to 7.9% uh, uh, mortality rate. Uh, moreover, uh, we also noticed that uh, patients with cardiovascular involvement uh, were uh, more likely to have a rise in their white cell count, and this was in 69.7% of the patients. Uh, also, uh, raised levels of troponin, uh, the dimer, uh, which was in 78.3% uh, of the patients. And this can be explained by that, uh, by the procoagulant action of the virus, and that the virus does not affect only the heart, it affects the lung, and uh, it can manifest as a pulmonary embolism. Um, again, uh, 
uh, also we noticed that uh, patients with cardiovascular involvement uh, were at a higher incidence of uh, multi-system involvement, and that's in the form of septic shock, ARDS, uh, renal failure, uh, coagulopathy, and these patients were more likely to require um, dialysis and ventilation. Uh, however, now the important uh, factor to look at is that these patients had a significantly high mortality rate, and that was 41.6%. Uh, and this reflects the overall severity of the disease. Now, uh, moving to the limitations, of course, as uh, with every study, there are certain limitations to try and overcome. Uh, and one of them was possible inherent differences in the quality of data collection. And uh, this is because uh, our study was uh, collected, uh, the data was collected retrospectively from different ter tertiary hospitals. However, uh, we did our best to, uh, we did our best to uh, try and overcome this, uh, uh, to ensure the consistency of the data. We were in contact with each other. Uh, we were also, uh, the data was also double checked even by the principal investigator himself. Uh, also, the quality of data collected was a reflection of the quality of data entered in the clinical case notes. Another thing was that the tests such as echocardiography were not performed routinely, and that is because they were limited to minimize the exposure of healthcare workers to COVID-19 patients because all the patients who were tested positive. And, uh, but however, they were done when it is necessary to do so. Um, some patients with limited information available, and that's because the data is collected from uh, tertiary hospitals and the number of patients were actually transferred from regional hospitals and they were already intubated. Uh, another factor is uh, the language barrier uh, with some patients. Uh, now, in conclusion, uh, patients who are uh, COVID-19, it's common to have the uh, cardiac involvement in patients with COVID-19. Uh, as in our study, third of these patients had cardiac involvement, which led to worse outcomes. Uh, a pre-existing history of coronary artery disease and rise of uh, high sensitivity troponin during, during admission uh, was found to be strongly associated with in-hospital mortality. Mm -hmm. And it's important to identify these risk factors as it could help to assess the prognosis of these patients at an early uh, stage. And with that, uh, I finished my presentation, but uh, I wanted to share with you guys that uh, one abstract got published in the Journal of American Heart Association. A uh, manuscript will be published this month, inshallah, and uh, two abstracts got accepted in journals of American College of Cardiology. Um, this is a capture of the abstract. And uh, this is our picture with my colleagues and uh, with our study being in the front page, uh, front cover of the Times of Oman. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mariam, for your wonderful presentation. If anyone has any questions for Mariam, please put them in the chat box and we'll have a Q&A session later. Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Razal Shabankere. She works at the Craniomaxillofacial Research Center in Tehran University, Iran. The floor is yours, Dr. Razal. Thanks for having me in your precious symposium. I'm Dr. Razal Shabankare uh, from the Craniomaxillofacial Research Center at Tehran University of Medical Sciences, and I'm a doctor of dent dental surgery. Uh, my presentation will be on uh, dental practice in the era of COVID-19, which is a review of literature. Uh, this study has been done in order to uh, provide both dental practitioners and patients who are seeking dental care with some informative and comprehensive information on dental practice. Uh, well, of course, this is not the first time that the whole world is tackling with a pandemic, but COVID-19 in a few short weeks affected almost every country, society, and aspect of modern life like never before, and dentistry has not been an exception. 
In terms of the exposure risk for various working categories, dental uh, practitioners uh, confront uh, the highest risk of COVID-19 infection due to a constant exposure to saliva, droplets, blood, and aerosols. Therefore, inhalation of infected droplets or aerosols in direct contact with contaminated instruments or surfaces puts both dental practitioners and patients at a state. Uh, moreover, all the patients seeking dental care in the era of COVID-19 pandemic should nevertheless be considered infected regardless of the non-appearance of common clinical manifestations of the disease. In fact, uh, the majority of the COVID-19 infected patients are either asymptomatic or represent with self-limiting mild to moderate symptoms who can be easily misinterpreted as healthy individuals. Uh, well, in the beginning of the COVID-19 outburst, utilization of dental services experienced a 38 decline, uh, where the proportion of dental and oral infections increased from 51% to 71.9% during this era. Investigations revealed that the closure of dental practices increased the severity and requirement for admission of dental infections by 45% which uh, reflects the essential impress of urgent dental care during the pandemic in order to uh, reduce pressure on secondary and tertiary care centers. Together with diagnostic role of dentists through oral manifestations of COVID-19 infection, dental practitioners had to take part as frontline healthcare professionals in order to fight with this phenomenon. So, by reviewing the present literature and dental practice in the era of COVID-19, we aim to review the challenges and perspectives of dentistry in terms of patient categorization for dental treatments, protective precautions in dental practice, dental drug prescription considerations, and oral manifestations of COVID-19 infection. Here, we summarize the proposed guidelines through which dental health professionals would be able to categorize the patients to five divided groups after a meticulous screening of them in terms of COVID-19 infection at the first place in order to uh, decide which dental procedure can be implemented for a specific patient. Well, group A of patients are asymptomatic, unsuspected, and unconfirmed patients. Group B are symptomatic or suspected, but unconfirmed patients. Group C are stable, confirmed uh, with mild infection with no hospitalization or oxygen therapy. Group D are unstable, confirmed, severe, and critical cases. And group E are recovered, confirmed, asymptomatic for at least 30 days after the last negative laboratory test. Various dental treatments and procedures have also been divided to five classes for easier decision making of the dentist by allocating each patient to category, uh, each patient category to specific classes uh, of dental treatment that can be implemented for the patients, which is depicted in the table. According to these tables that we have provided COVID-19 infection status, together with the urgency of dental treatment, leads to a rational decision making for treatment of the patients under the premise of adequate protection measures. Although, and that it has been suggested that full dental treatment can be implemented for recovered COVID-19 patients. Reported cases of COVID reoccurrence in convalescence accentuates the active surveillance of the virus for infectivity assessment. However, in brief emergency procedures that threats the life of patients such as uncontrolled bleeding or any circumstances that compromise the airway has to be implemented for all patient categories. Except for emergency procedures, no dental treatment can be done for symptomatic patients. Also, um, non aerosol generating urgent processes can be done for A, C, and E groups, where aerosol generating procedures can only be done for A and E, e groups. Of course, implementation of non-urgent and elective dental procedures, such as implant surgery, chronic periodontal diseases, aesthetic and preventive therapies should be avoided in this area. Era. In this part, we focus on uh, protective precautions in dental setting. 
Dental practitioners are advised to utilize telephonic triage for an initial assessment of the patients by asking three pertinent questions, including any recent travel history uh, to any area with high incidence of COVID-19, any exposure to a person with suspected or known COVID infection, and presence of any symptoms of the disease. The positive response um, of the patients to any of the questions should be followed by deferring the dental appointment for up to two weeks and thus self-quarantining at home. Soap and alcohol-based hand rubs are equally effective cleansers. However, hand washing with soap and water is capable of elim eliminating dirt, uh, body fluids, blood, and any other uh, visible hand contamination, whereas ABHRs are appropriate sanitizers for hands that are not visibly soiled. Despite the efficacy of chlorhexidine in reduction of chlorine forming units in dental aerosol, its effectiveness in, elim in eliminating COVID-19 is a matter of conjecture. Uh, so, COVID in iodine uh, and P or PVP1 gargle or mouthwash is the only promising and approved substance for eliminating coronaviruses and application of PVP1 nasal sprays together with COVID and iodine mouthwash minimizes COVID-19 transmission through virus expectoration in the form of aerosols. Although surgical masks protect mucous membrane of the nose and mouth for droplets spatter, they do not ensure a full protection against inhalation of airborne transmissive agents as declared by Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. A uh, surgical mask should be provided and obligatory for all the patients, visitors, and uh, personnel. Uh, patients should be asked to read on face covering after the uh, respirators are uh, uh, donned when performing an aerosol generating procedure. Uh, Filtering face P2 or FFP2 masks have the same indications as N95. However, FFP3 uh, respirators should be done when uh, performing emergency dental treatment. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, dental treatment for COVID 19 suspected patients. High efficacy particulate uh, arrestor or HEPA is an expensive air filtration device that can remove 99.97% of particles. And recent guidelines suggested uh, by CDC proposed that uh, the ut uh, utilization of portable HEPA air filtration units during ISO generating procedures uh, as the 6 to 15 um, ACH has been frequently cited for patient care areas, a range of 18 to 46 minutes of time gap is demanded between patients' appointments. In this part, we discuss considerations for dental drug prescription in dental practice. As the outburst of COVID-19 resulted in the limitation of dental practice to emergency treatments, Patients with dental pain were compelled to rely on supportive therapy by analgesics and NSAIDs administration for alleviation of their pain. However, the exacerbation of the symptoms of COVID-19 patients followed by ibuprofen administration casted attention to the possible unfavorable effects of the drug. Theoretically, capability of ibuprofen in increasing the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 by availability and interference with the immune system supported the enhancement of COVID-19 infection. Therefore, uh, prescription of paracetamol or acetaminophen as the first line drops for dental pain relief is suggested as a cautious solution. Also, azithromycin is the empiric medication for odontogenic infection in penicillin allergic patients. On the other hand, uh, many reports have focused on efficacy of a combined regime of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine for uh, subsidence of COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, considering the shift of dental services to emergency treatments and therefore a possible increase in antibiotic uh, prescription, Dentists should be vigilant in prescribing azithromycin, especially in countries 
uh, with high toll of COVID-19 patients in order to decrease the risk of antibiotics resistance and side effects. Amoxicillin or clindamycin are appropriate alternatives for azithromycin in the era of COVID-19 pandemic. Chloroquine also attracted a lot of attention in the early outburst of COVID-19 with regard to its inhibitory effect on COVID viral replication and its subsequent clinical e efficacy. And therefore, many countries have faced severe shortage of the drug. This is of paramount importance for the dentist to be uh, to consider um, the influence of the drug shortage on chloroquine dependent dental patients, such as the somatic lupus erythematous and uh, sh uh, sugaring syndrome patients with oral manifestations. Moreover, uh, dentists should be acquainted with possible oral complications of chloroquine administration, such as melanotic pigmentation and lichenate reaction of the oral mucosa. The presence of COVID-19 genom in saliva of the majority of patients indicates potential infection of the salivary glands, which makes saliva a dependable and comfortable alternative to nasal or oropharyngeal sampling. Taste or olfactory disorders are common oral manifestations of COVID-19 as the virus penetrates taste buds of the tongue via ACE2 receptors. Therefore, dentists should be aware of any alterations in taste in forms of dysgeusia and burning mouth syndrome as they might uh, be representative of the respiratory diagnostic manifestation of COVID-19 infection. <clears throat> The role of dental practitioners in preventing the transmission of COVID-19 is pivotal. Despite the suspension of routine dental care in many countries around the world, dental professionals perceive a moral duty uh, to take part in the global fight against the pandemic. Additionally, dentists can also contribute to initial diagnosis of the disease as it may represent with oral manifestations. In the light of the protective precautions for dental practice, dentists are able to perform safe dental treatment uh, for the patients in the era of COVID-19 pandemic. Dentists should be able to categorize the patients based on their health status and treatment demands to make a moral and beneficial decision. As COVID-19 patients uh, may represent with asymptomatic or medically unexplained symptoms, through screening of the patient in terms of specific or non-specific mm -hmm. symptoms of infection and following protective precautions of, uh, is of uh, utmost importance in dental practice. Uh, this study ha has been uh, available on Journal of uh, Primary Care and Medicine um, in full text. It's accessible in this website, in this journal. Uh, Thanks for your attention and time. In case of any questions, I'll be available in the mentioned links. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hazal, for your wonderful presentation. Our final presenter for today is Ms. Manar al Shahi. She is an MD5 student here at National University. Her topic is medical students' perception and experiences with online clinical teaching and learning at the College of Medicine during COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Anna. Thank you, Anna, for the presentation. Okay. Um, Is my screen as a direct for you all? Yes, just put it on a slideshow. No. Okay, so we did the program. This is Manal Shehe, 60 month of student in the College of Medicine and Health Sciences at the National University. I will present today our uh, paper about the current COVID pandemic and medical education and health students' perception and experiences with online clinical teaching and learning at the College of Medicine in Oman. Supervised by Dr. Ferdos Jahan, Associate Professor and the HOD Family Medicine Department in our country. Okay, so starting with the introduction, as we know, clinical teaching is a form of interpersonal communication between a teacher and a learner. It's mainly involved a patient or patient scenario. 
the student learns how to evaluate the patient and manage the, the program. The ideal clinical teaching and learning is done in patient care area, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, all clinical and classroom teaching was suspended. This study was in May, John, after the lockdown was there and the college start um, the application of GoTo webinar to be like alternative way to continue the online study. Okay, the aim of the study was to know medical student perception and experiences with online clinical teaching and there. The method was a cross-sectional study was conducted at the College of Medicine and Health Sciences of the National University. All the students in sixth and seventh year considered to participate in a group in the study for a self-help survey, like a Google form. Statistical analysis was performed using a statistical package for social sciences. And the, the data was expressed in frequencies for the questionnaire response calculated for all variables in numbers and percentage. Independent sample t-test was used to compare differences between uh, two groups. Okay. And data collection, a total of 91 students, clinical uh, students participated in the study, of which 10.2% were male and 46.2% were uh, a minor citizen. 97.5 students were 6 year and 72.5 were 7 year students. Their answers were labeled as strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, and strongly disagree. Okay, here you can see this was the most important things in our survey, like having adequate time for case-based preparation and discussion. As you see here, most of the students labeled agree and strongly agree in most of the items. Uh, this was a good opportunity for reflection and participation and to share knowledge. Also, 47 and five, 47 uh, the student uh, put it as agree, like 51%, as well 50.5% case agree to that case based scenario were very useful, relevant and practical. And uh, also here 35.2 percent agreed that they have learned how to become a facilitator and peer teacher. And also here 48 and 52.7 uh, percent had given the opportunity to talk and discuss in the online um, teaching session. And also here 56 percent facilitation of the clinical session by a faculty was very smooth, good, and informative. Actually, in our study, um, most of the students, like 69.2 um, of the students, did not experience any problem in logging into registration to go to webinar application. As I told you, go to, to go to webinar application was the uh, application first used by the uh, college to continue the online teaching after the lockdown. And the students were uh, generally satisfied with the teaching and learning strategies in our study. 74.1 uh, of students in our study thinks that online learning should be included in clinical teaching. Majority of clinical students agreed that case based scenario was very, very useful, relevant, and practical good opportunity for reflection, participation, and to share knowledge. Opportunity of clinical learning as well. Okay. Here was for the assessment during the teaching regarding the feedback and assessment during the online teaching. As you can see here, the agree was the dominant answer. As regarding the feedback during online teaching, the students feel that facilitators have given constructive feedback to motivate in depth learning and the clinical thinking as well as reasoning in the clinical teaching and learning as well. Okay, a medical student has shown positive attitude and motivation towards webinar clinical teaching. Online webinar teaching can offer more diverse and effective educational opportunities. Medical students in clinical years are self-directed learners but need depth um, learning with maximum hands on practice. Uh, the problem was that and here the webinar teaching has impacted medical students' education, particularly affecting the hands on practice and training, which is limited and mandatory to become adopted. The main concern was that disruption during the pandemic, um, that um, disruption during the pandemic has a number of effects on students' confidence and willingness to become a practicing doctor. As a frontline workforce, it's essential and crucial to maintain their well being with um, such as a proper injection support and supervision. So, maybe this was 
the somehow the only problem with online teaching with the clinical students that we so, somehow students lose the confidence and practice like being a practicing doctor with, with online teaching but that was temporary for just a short time so I think things may get better in the future and uh, special thanks for uh, Dr. Ferdos Jahan, the founding author of Department of Family Medicine and its audio family medicine partners in our college, Dr. Mohamed Siddiqui from the Department of Research in the Saskatchewan Health Authority in Canada. And the paper is accepted for publication in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. Okay. Thank you. That's what my presentation. Thank you so much, Manad, for your wonderful presentation. Okay, now we'll continue with the Q&A Q session with Dr. Najib Siddi. <clears throat> thank you very much, Aisha, and thank you very much for all the speakers tonight. Uh, uh, I don't see any question in the chat box. Please, if you have any question, can you write in the chat box for the last three speakers? Uh, I have one question for Dr. Ghazal about the uh, COVID infection. My question is that do you have any data showing that the dental practice or the dentists are more exposed to the COVID infection? I, th I think Dr. Ghazal is not uh, around. So there is uh, no new no new question in the chat box. So I think we can uh, now come to the end of this symposium. So I would first of all, I am deeply grateful to our vice chancellor, Dr. Ali bin Saud Al Baymani. Our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dr. Salim Bil Khamis Al Aremi, and our beloved Dean, Professor Muhammad Shafi, for their valuable time they spend with us and grace the occasion. I would like to extend my special thanks to all the speakers tonight and our foreign speakers from New York and Tehran who joined us in real time and added a new dimension to this symposium. This could now easily be possible due to the availability of online WebEx platform. This pandemic has really made this world a small village and enable us to connect to the researchers and professors all over the world to achieve our goals of international research exchanges. I also extend my sincere thanks to our colleagues from Sultan Qaboos University and Nizwa University in Oman who enriched this event with their valuable research presentations. I appreciate all the young doctors and our College of Medicine MD students who presented their original research work in this symposium. In the end, I congratulate the members of the organizing committee in particular our MD students and SCORI local officer, Ms. Yasmin and Ms. Aisha, who work day and night to make this activity a big success. Last but not the least, we could have not done this online symposium without the extraordinary support of Mr. Saif Al Bidwawi, our IT manager, Ms. Arwa Al Sabri, Dean's secretary for making all these schedules, and Dr. Saud Al Okla, our research committee chair. With this, I now close this symposium until next year, March 2022, when we will meet again with a much better program, inshallah. Thank you for all attending and taking part in the question answer session. Uh, goodbye and mas salam. Thank you so much.